Okay, thank you, Bart. Um, I've just uh, had a last-minute panic, so uh, given, given that I have 45 minutes to present, I, I asked my, my uh, crew at home to help me get a demo together for today, which was working up until about an hour ago. And just I checked it now, and it's uh, not what I expected. So um, I may not fill the full 45 minutes here, or <laughs> probably not quite close to it. But nonetheless, I do have a presentation to um, introduce the concept of the project, um, some of the uh, uh, privacy aware access controls, and um, I have some good screenshots of, of, the, of the work that, as it stands. And at the end, when I get to the end, I'll try and run the demo. And if it's in the same situation it was two minutes ago, um, there won't be a demo. But uh, I'll, do, I'll do my best. My guys at home are trying to have a look at it and trying to fix it. So the work I'm presenting comes from um, an FP7 project uh, called OpenEye. And OpenEye, uh, the, the main focus of OpenEye is to provide uh, mobile app developers with a platform um, that allows uh, that inspires innovation in the mobile app industry. Um, this project is, uh, the outputs of the project are released as a uh, open source project called PEAT. And you can see the link up here. And I just assume you, ha you, you can have access to these slides. It will be available to everybody here, yeah. So um, at times you'll hear me say OpenEye, at times you'll hear me say PEAT. They're more or less interoperable, and some of the slides are probably a little out of date. They have just the OpenEye on it, and some will have PEAT. So the, the, the purpose of PEAT platform slash OpenEye uh, project was to provide um, a platform for app developers, on the one hand, to easily deploy apps, and from the user's point of view, um, a means of taking control of their, of their personal data through uh, a personal data store, which we call a, a cloudlet. This is the architecture from the OpenEye project. Um, and the, the, the central part here is the, is the OpenEye platform, or the PEAT platform, which comprises three uh, parts, an API framework, a security framework, and the cloudlet framework. Um, the focus of the project is the mobile application space. So um, the project provides a mobile SDK and client libraries in, in that space. So the one, one thing here is I should point out, actually, is the API framework um, allows for connection with other cloud-based, third-party cloud-based services. But I'm not going to discuss that today. It wasn't really the work that my institution was involved in. It was another part of the project. But um, the, the idea here is to give users control over their data through the deployment of a uh, personal cloudlet. Uh, this cloudlet is coupled with a security framework for uh, authentication and authorization. And it links in with the API framework, which provides the main functionality of the OpenEye platform. So the idea is that um, an app developer would, from, from, the, from the platform, um, generate a mobile client library. So we have an Android and HTML5 slash JavaScript type uh, libraries available. Um, and from that, on, on <coughs> excuse me, on, using, using that uh, library can develop uh, applications which hook into the, the platform itself. Um, and I'll talk in more detail probably mostly about the cloud, Cloudlet framework as we, as we progress. So just to talk about some of the components from that architecture, the mobile client library is providing access to the API security and personal cloudlet frameworks. And it's provided two uh, client libraries, as I said, a cross-platform HTML JavaScript library and a native Android client library. And the security part of the OpenEye platform uh, provides access control functionality, and it's coupled tightly with the cloudlet and the API frameworks. It provides the users with control <coughs> over their personal data and the cloud-based uh, third-party services that they interact with. The API framework is uh, capable of interoperating inter with a variety of cloud-based services um, and promotes innovation by offering app, app developers frameworks to allow them to design and build complex applications uh, involving the combination of <coughs> independent cloud-based services. 
but just the, the, the focus of this presentation is about the personal cloudlet framework. And the idea of the cloudlet framework is to provide um, consumers with a single location to store and control their personal data. So it's effectively a personal data store within the um, OpenEye platform. And in conjunction with the security framework, uh, empowers consumers and users to remain in control of their data and give assurances that that data is not being used without their consent. So, so the objectives are to uh, build key technology enablers, ensure practical uh, applicability and efficient use of the OpenAI platform, and to provide an open sor source platform that allows uh, users to create, deploy, and manage their own personal space in the cloud, which is known as the personal, personal cloudlet. Each one of these cloudlets constitutes an entity that will be linked directly with the user's identity. Um, I'm hoping I can demonstrate some of this at the, at the end of the talk, but I have some slides anyway which will show how that's done in practical terms. Uh, thirdly, the obje a third objective is to provide a uh, novel, consistent, user-centric application experience for cloud-based services. So not only across different devices, but also across different applications. So um, in this sense, the idea here is that application developers can define um, types data types that are used by their data, but that those data types are open and public across the platform. So then other application developers can see those types and reuse those types in their application and request um, instances of those type objects from the user's cloudlet um, in their application. So the types, types are, are considered, all types are considered public, um, but for each application must define what types they will use from the cloudlet and also define the, the permissions manifest for those, for those types. So just in terms of uh, implementation, uh, the challenges of implementation, how can we um, develop such a secure privacy concerned web framework um, to provide this user centric management to dynamic data and APIs. And also at the same time provide developers with uh, the ability to access the data in a, in a privacy concerning manner. So our implementation, uh, these are some of the technologies that we've used. So we, you know, we use, um, it's, we're basically building a distributed application which is composed of a number of soft, software components. Um, we take a microservices uh, type architecture approach and some of the technology we're using are Node.js, Mongrel2, Zero, Message Queue, um, JWT, Swagger for REST definitions, um, Couchbase as an OSQL database. Uh, JSON as a data format and used in transport and at rest. And as I said, a microservices uh, distributed application. So the personal cloud itself has a number of components um, which are built on, on top of those technologies I've just mentioned. So we have uh, data access co uh, uh, components type um, access components, notification services, authentication, authorization, um, platform management, and also some user interfaces for the developer and the user to um, get a view of the data that's been uh, created by applications. So just to go through some of those uh, individually, uh, data storage components can, can store um, binary data as, as well as like uh, structured uh, JSON data. So we have a notification service um, which allows users to link events on their data, accesses to their data with specific um, types of notifications and we've allowed for um, email, SMS, uh, REST call, server side events and uh, Google Cloud messaging. So just in terms of authentication, authorization, and accounting, um, the authentication and author authorization mechanisms are, in, are part of the security framework, but the details of the access requests, uh, subsequent actions, and uh, responses are monitored and logged for uh, within, the, within the personal cloudlet. Um, also, uh, management of permissions is, is of data is, is logged in the, in the cloudlet. So in terms of uh, data access, all data is accessed by some a a APIs, uh, two of which mainly uh, data API and a type API. And they can ensure they, the, purpose is, the idea is to ensure a consistent access point for all services. 
and uh, the API framework and third-party services. So uh, along with the AAA components and permissions, the Cloudlet owner is in control of who and what can access each piece of their data within their personal Cloudlet. Uh, the user, user interfaces are to empower the Cloudlet owners in the management of their Cloudlet and have a, they have a standalone GUI, um, which I'm hoping to show in a demo <laughs> in a little while. Um, this allows them to view access log viewing, preference editing, and permissions editing. There's also a data aggregator component in there, which, uh, which allows for third parties the ability to view aggregated user data from multiple cloudlets. Um, and this, but this conceals the individual cloud owner's identity. So I just want to talk about some of the um, user-centric and privacy-preserving features. Uh, the project make, makes use of JSON web tokens, which you probably know are Base64 encoded JSON objects. And th these are extended within OpenEye to provide a means of um, representing the context of calling parties on data access. So, and using this has enables a REST-based framework to manage sessions and, and claims using JSON web tokens. So we have two main types of tokens, one of which are, are session tokens, uh, really responsible for when users are logged in, and also some auth tokens, which are generated from the SDK, which combine the user and developer login. And the user um, does this through a GUI, and the developer through the API and secret keys. So auth tokens restrict um, data access to data common to both app developer and the user as dictated through the permissions uh, mechanism. In terms of uh, data reusability and app interoperability, um, data is, is persisted in a NoSQL document store and the Cloudlet is generally composed of a set of JSON objects. And all objects uh, adhere to a predefined open eye type. As I said earlier, these, these types are all public and can be reused by developers across applications. So this is a view of the definition of what those, those types look like. Um, the type is stored as a JSON object, and they describe uh, rules for those objects. So you effectively have here. So you have like um, a reference, which is a human readable uh, description such as like user profile, for example. Um, you have a context which contains an array of object members. So this is the actual core data that's, that's the, within the type. Um, they have, these can be primitive types, but there's also uh, types from the graph API, uh, which links with third-party web services that you can include in here, and also reuse other open eye types within here. Um, so the context is uh, just a description of what the object member is. So all types are public and reusable by the developer community. Uh, types are immutable, so once they're created, they cannot be altered, and they're tightly integrated with the auth dialogues and permissions mechanism. So uh, using a web interface, we have a type builder GUI um, from the, from the, on the platform, which provided to make it easier to build types, and I can show you this here. So on the left-hand side here, we have the name of the, of the, the type and where you can actually add uh, individual members. In the center here, you, you have the context, which is like a set of an array of object types, of, of, of I beg your pardon, an array of members, um, which are defined as, in this case, relatively simple um, primitive types, so two, two strings and an int in this case. And on the right-hand side, you can see you get a sample object of what a sample object would look like, and this is the actual um, the, the type definition that's available here. So in terms of access control, Cloudlet objects have, every object stored in the Cloudlet has associated permissions object with it. And the permissions object provides information on which apps are allowed to access the object. Um, app developers can request access by object or by type, and requests can be scoped by app or by Cloudlet. So the owner can edit permissions based on the type um, of, and the app, et cetera. So from the developer's point of view, when they're creating permissions for, uh, for a client, they have in the top left-hand corner the type IDs, and then with it, for each of those type IDs, they can set the, the, the kind of uh, the app level and the cloudlet level um, access values for their application. So that when the, when the user runs this application on a mobile device, 
these are the permissions that there are being requested for those for those objects for those um, objects, or rather from those types, uh, which are stored as objects in the in the in the data store. So from the user dashboard point of view. Um, on the mobile device, embedded in the library as part of the uh, as part of the mobile client library, there's a user dashboard which allows the end user to uh, view their data, audit the list of access requests and response, and view and edit permissions and set notifications for data access requests. Uh, probably, I have a, here a simple use case. So, we recently. Um, project has about two, uh, one month left to run and they're still working away on some of the uh, back end platform so a lot of the work is still ongoing but we have um, teamed up with an Irish SME um, called Ada which is uh, Internet of Things type startup and they deal with some uh, private data and they've asked us to uh, integrate their uh, integrate with our um, uh, PEED platform for their uh, mobile uh, application offering. So they provide uh, wearable device monitors, which the user wears at night. It's a fertility tracker. So the idea is that the user wears um, a device while they sleep. Um, the, the data collected is stored in the data store and augmented with um, individual or questions that the app will ask the user during the day. You can see here that the the application is like so you have some this is like per, general like uh, kind of personal information just block the name out there um, and then there is there are some questions here about like how did you sleep and what was your what's your oral temperature um, so quite personal data and health related data so they were very keen that they had um, uh, a solution for access control on this and they chose our, our platform as a as a means of, of achieving that So in order to integrate their current application with, with Peace, what did they have to do? So they had to define a set of types through the admin portal and create permissions manifest with those types, um, include the client library in the Android application, and use utility classes to persist the data to the back end. Um, so also um, user authentication, authorization, and session management is automatically handled by the client li library. So I can show you some of, the, some of the code in a little while, wh how, how that's achieved. Um, the idea really is to abstract away all, all the kind of uh, um, authentication, authorization, and session management from the app developer, and this is all handled automatically by the PEAT platform. Um, some of their data types that they've defined, so they have a temperature reading on the left-hand side here uh, with a timestamp, different, various, three different ones from different sensors. Um, they also have uh, a daily menstruation cycle log. So, you know, this, this is pretty personal data. And um, this data on the right-hand side is, these are questions that they ask the user. This is automatically connect, collected from the, from the device. And this is uh, data that the, the, the user inputs. So when the, when the app um, starts first, uh, com the permissions manifest is uh, retrieved from the platform and it creates a permissions dialog via the um, via the user dashboard. Um, the permissions combined with the data is built to me build to use to build these these meaningful uh, dialogues. So the user can choose to approve or cancel the request. So when they start a new application, it might say that um, this application wants to access uh, data from your from your cloudlet. Do you want do you approve or or um, revoke this? or cancel this um, request. Um, so this approval can be revoked later through the user dashboard. And the user dashboard is um, embedded in the SDK. And you sw if you swipe to the right from the application, um, you, you take to the, the, the dashboard menu, where the user is allowed to look at the app that, they're, that, they're, um, that have access to their personal uh, data cloudlet and look at the data that those apps um, have access to. You also have the possibility to remove some of that data and um, ultimately to change permissions on individual data objects. So you could say that you can, from the user's point of view, can um, 
edit which applications have read access to which elements of their data store. So really, that's really just what, that slide is just what I was just um, discussing there. It allows to manipulate the data and the permissions directly through the dashboard. So permissions are listed on a per application basis and they include a PWIC analytics engine, which currently isn't working, uh, has been integrated in there. So it allows the user to perform some analytics on the data, on the access requests and responses to their, to their data store. Um, so the idea here is really to give the user a view of their own personal data, um, who's accessing it, when they're accessing it, what applications, have uh, various access rights to that data, and also to allow the user to manage those uh, permissions, um, et cetera. And at this point, I was hoping to do a demo, and we can see, and if not, I can, I can still show you, um, okay, I have a message here. I can. I'm afraid it's still not working. Um, what was he saying? Here we are, live chat. So um, oh, this worked two hours ago. It's the worst thing about live demos is that, you know, invariably they work two hours before. Yes? There is, there is plenty of time. Um, what is the login process? For example, I get an app for this device and then want to say store my data. And then you say, then there was a screen saying there is this account of your system of this PR. And is there multiple login necessary or are the apps designed that when I have no account yet at this um, Cloud Lab platform, um, it's implicitly created or what's the idea here? Yeah, well, if there's no account already. Okay, so the, the app developer um, bundles the library with the with the application. Mm -hmm. The user loads the application. It connects to the platform and requests the user to log in mm -hmm. to that platform. In the event that that user is already not logged on that instance of the platform, um, they can create an account on that platform in that moment. But um, then there are two logins: one for the application for the data, and then for this technical platform in the background. There are two steps to take. If I'm not already logged in into the platform, if I have no account. We have to create an account and then log in. Okay, then from the contractual perspective, I have two contracts, one with the application and one with the account, um, uh, well, with, the, uh, with the platform. Okay, so the, the account on the platform effectively is my instance of the data store. So that's my, my data store. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have, a, I have, my login is to the platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, just one, one login. Yep. Okay, but if the, for example, if I had an, if an application, it could be something, for example, that selling stuff, uh, selling stuff, yes. not only for this information, and then I would need to log in therefore, because I have a contractual, I have, to, the data will be will be shared between these platforms, but then I have to look in two times and have two different counterparts, or um, for for the for the developer's backend system. No, for me as a user of the app. For a user of the app, like your, your session login for using the app is your login to the platform. So for the example that you gave with the idea, I, yes. yeah, so first you would have to log in into the idea app and then you need to log in somehow into the backend platform to get access to your data. That's the question, right? Are there two logins or is there one login? Um, on that instance, I, I believe there are two logins in, in that instance, yeah. For, for IAD, yes, yeah. But the user data is all stored in the, in the personal cloudlet, yeah. Okay. And let me see. Oh, okay. You know what, I'm gonna 
I'll try this in a different browser. That's what I suspect might well be the problem here. So I have um, I have some created here. So I made this this demo area so you can view here. This is the um, so I ha I have this this type that I've created here. Oh, it's a lot heavy. Okay, really. Okay. Um, okay. So in effect, um, I won't. I, won't, I don't have time to go through actually the entire making of the, uh, a, a fresh client and new types here. I doubt I, I, I've got five minutes, is it? Okay, okay. So basically what's happened here is that what happens is you register your client, you create some um, type IDs, here, some types here, and then from your clients you associate it with those. This is from the developer's point of view. Um, from, those, from that point of view you create um, a permissions manifest which says basically here it says for at the app level you can create read update and delete this data of this type okay so from when the developer then is writing their code they will insert you you receive your API key here and a secret key for the client access um, which is then placed into the application here. Um, so when you're actually accessing a type, you need this type ID with, within the Android code. So that's this type ID here. I hope. One five four. This is a different one. So this is just, in, in this case, there is no delete um, permission here. So I can show you here. So when you're creating, when you're creating the data, you use this, you just use the library to get the API key, et cetera. And when we're creating data here, we just set the type, create it, and then get an instance of this with a, new, with a create re, uh, a data result. So this is trying to create an object, and you pass this result here to it, this result type, and define like what happens on uh, various responses on success, on permission denied, on failure. So in this particular instance, we have, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. three different permissions. We have like it's allowed to create, read, and update, but not allowed to delete in this case. So let me log out of here. So from the user's point of view then, if we run this app. do live demos I think is definitely a message to learn uh, Fail to create object okay Okay, um, I think I have run out of time anyway, have I? Okay, so I'm really sorry that my demo really wasn't up to scratch at all, and I'm going to kill these guys when I get home. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm blaming somebody else, and that's that. 
So um, are there any other any questions? Do you do anything to stop the person who's received the data from the user passing it on to someone else? Or is that just, there you is. have to trust them? Well, there is an element of trust there. I mean, that's an obvious problem that you could have. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a common problem in such a, such a type of uh, system. Um, so very difficult to, 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 yeah. to achieve that, really. Because um, once you're saying you can read this data, then, well, you can read this data. Um, so very, the answer, short answer is no, we don't. First off, uh, thank you for uh, doing something about privacy and cloud. Uh, second of all, do you have uh, uh, any plans for offline access of that data? Like how would applications that may need to go offline from time to time, uh, do you need to be online to access the, the, the cloud data or you, you need to sync it? To or? The, the, the the cloudlet itself can be deployed in multiple scenarios. So you could affect, you could deploy that on your on your local phone and and sync your cloudlets together. So, yeah, so you could do that. They've, they've I've seen these guys. They've had it running on like plug servers, and they've had a cut down version of it running on a phone as well. So yeah, so the the, the cloudlet is is something that can be effectively deployed anywhere, but the access to the data is via the um, via the cloudlet uh, interface. Provide the platform interface, rather. Does that answer your question? So, if you want to take it offline, effectively, you you also you need to run the platform locally to do that. Okay. Um, so, you mentioned that you have um, that the de other developers can use existing data types. Yeah. Um, that would mean if uh, someone develops this for, um, fertility app and there's these uh, data types to find, if I decide to go and develop a different type, those types would be available to me, right? Yes. How do you avoid type duplication so that I'm not, uh, there's not like 15 different types for birthdays, for example? Um, what they're working on at the moment is that there, there's a registry of types there. So if you, if you want to search for a type that you say you, you want a birthday with, they're working on it at the moment, an interface to the registry exists, but at the moment there's no search facility on the, on the, um, the, uh, the, the web interface. But the idea was, would be that you search that um, registry for existing types such as birthday. But if you put in, if you put in um, identical types, like say you have a structure of a type that's identical to some other type in there that represents it with, with similar name, with the same names, like you'll get, actually create an error because the type is, is generated from a hash of those, of that data. Um, so the idea is that you'll have a, a, a searchable interface of the registry that you can discover types that you want, might want to reuse. Yeah. So in the case of the fertility tracker, like if I, if I wanted to create um, another application that was you know, your, your all um, dancing health application, and I might discover that, I could discover through that registry search that such types exist, um, but I, I can't look at the data, and I can't even see how much data is there. I don't even know if anybody's got any instances of that data. But I can in import those types, wrap it into my application, and then if one of the users of the previous application has some data in place, when they start the application, they're asked, will you allow this application to access instances of this data type? Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Just one, little, uh, just one little question. How do you handle then um, the changes on the data types, like birthday, and then somebody wants to have it a in a little bit different flavor, and that's it. that person is the originator of the type, the one that first uploaded it? Okay, so, uh, I, uh, yeah. Uh, when you want to change the structure of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so you need to create a new type in that, in that case. You can, you can delete that type and start at scratch, but then you lose all your, all your data. Um, yeah, I, I, I asked the guys, I wasn't in this project from the start, right? I was, to be honest, I was dragged in the last six months and they say, we need some publications, so please help us publish. So that's my role in this project, you know, so I'm, I'm sorry, you know. But uh, I asked the same question, you know. But they've, they've made a decision at some point at the start or earlier on in the design process that all the types are immutable. So effectively, once you create the type, that's it. 
Yeah. Um, so if you want to create a new type that's similar to that, you've got to create a new type, basically. So. Okay. More questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you.